Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is session 59 in Sonship Orientation. Wow, 59 sessions in Sonship Orientation. But the good news is, like I told you last week, we are right around the corner from being back into Romans 8. So we're almost done with our orientation. Then we'll start our Sonship Establishment, where you'll be for the next, what, 12 years. So there you go. All right. Uh, what we've been doing is we've been looking at those two major commitments that a son makes to his, um, a a as a son, first of all, to the, the sonship education. You already know about that. We're going to leave that behind. But there were three components to that commitment to the education. And now we're going to begin to look at, just as we started at the end of the last session, to look at the commitment to edification. Don't let that word scare you. Remember back when we were in sanctification. I can remember um, my, my buddy out in Nebraska calling me up a few weeks ago and he said, man, that stuff on sanctification was great. He said, especially because now I understand what sanctification is. He said, all my life, I only heard the word a few times. Nobody ever explained it. He said, I think it's because they didn't know what it was. And he said, but now I get it. And he said, that's great. Well, edification is another one of those words that we don't look at very often. So let me put this in a nutshell for you. This is real easy. When you go to school, you get data. That's the education. And that's really all you need when you go to school normally. But in the Bible, God is doing more than just giving you information, more than just giving you data. What he wants to do, and what this book has the power to do, is it has the power to effectually work in your inner man. Uh-oh, now I've done one of those other terms, effectually. And we've, we've talked about that a little bit. It means more than just being effective. But this book, because it is the Word of God, has the power to take the words that are printed on the page and produce something in you that is very real that you can live out of every day. I tried to illustrate that the last time by talking about when you go through the sufferings of this life, there is a doctrine that is given to you in the Bible that allows you to be able to endure those sufferings. In fact, there's a step up from that doctrine that will eventually, and with regard to the sufferings of Christ, allow you to not just endure them, but to take pleasure in them. And, uh, and there's a sense in which the Bible talks about that. And then, of course, as you become a, a more fully educated son, to actually begin to rejoice in tribulations. That's something that, without an effectual working, could never happen. The only thing that would happen then is that you would be going through... Uh, calamities and tribulations and sufferings and distresses and all those kinds of issues and it would just be like one thing after another taking its toll on you. But this book has the ability to produce something in you that you really can rely on and you can live out of that is beyond. It is a power that God is manifesting in us that is beyond anything that's ever been put on display in this world. Now we are going to get to that <clears throat> but what I'm trying to say is this. It's more than just getting a bunch of Bible facts. If you're really going to become an educated son or daughter of your heavenly father that's going to be able to properly function in the heavenly places, you're going to have to make that commitment to the education, but then you're also going to have to have a commitment to the edification. And just as the education had three parts to that, that measured that commitment, there are three issues with regard to the edification. But for the edification, it's a little different. And I'm glad that it is because the commitment to the education was all about our commitment. The commitment to the edification, what you're going to see is that God himself is going to undertake to do three specific things. And what he is trying to do is get you to so believe so trust what he is going to tell you that that edification will take place because here's your part in the edification to believe what he says and that's really what it's going to be about can you believe 
what your heavenly Father is going to tell you. Now with that in mind, let me take you to the verses that we're looking at. This is the exhortation back in Israel's program. Take a look in Proverbs chapter 2. And here are those three issues and the result of those three issues. Proverbs 2, beginning in verse 6. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. And you can see there the way verse 9 introduces itself is if those, three, those first three things are properly accomplished and believed, then there is a result, a benefit that you have from that. And what that benefit is, is that that thing that you learned that was just information or data has now effectually, it's become your edification. It has effectually worked to actually produce all those things in you and you're able to live out of those on a daily basis. <clears throat> now, I gave you last time the three issues that are contained in these verses. Let me put them up on the board for you. I don't have a note taker for you today, so giving you a day off. All I ask is that if you go to sleep, don't snore. That's all I'm asking. Here we go. The three issues regarding the commitment to edification are, first of all, the nature of the curriculum. He is going to show you the nature of his curriculum, and that's intended to produce something in you. The second one is the trustworthiness of the one who wrote it. And who is the one that wrote it? Right, that, that, that curriculum for us is contained in His Word, and God is the author of that. Now, men may have written it, but they're, they're inspired of God to write that, and that record has been preserved for us without error. The third one is the value of being edified by what you learn. And those are the three issues that we now have to look at briefly. And I told you there was two things we were going to do before we got back to Romans 8, and that is to briefly look at these issues about our edification. And the other thing is to kind of get ourselves oriented to the first thing that we're going to encounter in that education so that we've kind of been set up in our mind and we know what's coming. Now, <clears throat> the first thing God does as your heavenly father and you as his adopted sons and daughters, what he does is he is going to demonstrate the nature, I'm going to go back to number one, and we're going to spend a little time on that. He is going to demonstrate the nature of his curriculum. And when I talk about the nature of his curriculum, I'm talking about the character of that curriculum and the fact that it, it is a certain kind of curriculum. Now, you know what a curriculum is. It's something that you would lay out to do a course of study. And if you are going to get, when you, does it matter? If you die and you go up to the third heaven, and you're absent from the body and present with the Lord, that's great. But as soon as this age is over and the rapture happens, that soul and spirit is coming back. That body that was put in a casket is going to get reformed into a glorified body. Your soul and spirit is going back into that glorified body, and then you're going to go to the heavenly places. That's the whole reason you're given that body, is because you can't function out there in this body. That would be tough, wouldn't it? First, you'd have to hold your breath a really long time. There's no air out there. This, this wouldn't work for you. <clears throat> so God equips you with everything that you need to do that. When you get up there, you're go well, I've left out a few things, but we'll go through the judgment seat of Christ, all that kind of business. But when you get up there, you're going to be placed into a certain position in the heavenly places. And the position that you're going to be placed in is the position that is commensurate with what you know how to do. If, if NASA hired me today and said, what can you do? I go, I, what kind of jobs have you got available? You know what I'd probably wind up doing at NASA? Gloria? All right, let's be real about it. I'd be sweeping the floors. Thanks a lot. Gloria. Because that's all I'm qualified to do. I mean, what if they said, you know what, we need you, need you to engineer the, the, 
you know, the engines on this rocket, or, you know, uh, we need you to redesign the inside of the shuttle, or, you know, we, we need you to calculate a new trajectory, you know, for how things, you know, who would want to climb in that ship after I did that? But I'm not qualified to do that. What this education is doing is qualifying you to go to work with your Heavenly Father in His business every day in eternity. And that really is, you know, as we've talked about this plenty of times, what everybody wonders, what am I going to be doing in heaven? The idea that you're going to get in your heavenly hammock and strum a harp and just kind of go back and forth in the breeze and sip lemonade is not what the Bible tells you about. There's a... <laughs> I, remember, I remember working with a preacher in Baton Rouge and an evangelist came in one time and he's preaching. He said, when you get to heaven, you're going to work. I remember the preacher leaning over to me and he said, I ain't going. Um, I'm wore out. But the thing is, when you get to heaven, work is not going to be like it is for you now. Because you're really created for that kind of work and you're going to have everything you need to get that kind of work done. And, and, and it's going to be, and by the way, what you're going to be involved in is the most glorious and wonderful thing that your eyes will have ever seen. There is nothing that has ever taken place on the face of this earth that will hold a candle to what's waiting for you up there. So, of course, what we're trying to do is get this education. And the first thing your father is going to do is he is going to show you the nature of this curriculum and that it has the ability to do just what we talked about because this is the edification. It has the ability to effectually work in you to produce everything that you're going to need both now and in eternity. And what he's trying to do by that is get you to trust him completely. Now, you, that's not a new thing because at some point you have already completely trusted him in some area. What area was that? Yeah, for your salvation. You completely trusted him. For that, by the way, that 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 trust ought to be so complete that if what Jesus did wasn't good enough, you're in trouble. But by the way, if you're trusting anything besides what He did, you are in trouble because you rely completely upon Him to accomplish everything that's needed to save you from the debt and penalty of your sin. Well, so here are the things with regard to this that your father needs you to know. He needs you to know that, the, and I'm going to use the, the scripture that, the, that we just read. We're going to come back and look at those verses individually in just a moment. But the words that come out of his mouth or the doctrines that you're going to be presented with in the Bible actually do have the ability to produce an edification in you. They really do have the ability to effectually work in you. And that they can produce in you everything that you're going to need and nothing is going to be left out. That's what he's trying to show you when he shows you the nature of the curriculum. It would be just like um, maybe, you're, maybe you're afraid of riding you know, one of the rides at Six Flags. And you're thinking, if I get on that thing, it'll come off the track. I'll be 100 feet in the air, and I'll be sailing at 40 miles an hour, and then I'm in trouble. And what they would try to do to allay your fears is they would talk to you about all the safety components that are in place. I know you're giving me that look like, I don't care what they say, I'm not getting on that ride. I get it, okay. But you understand, they, they would try to do that. Well, here's what your father's really trying to do by showing you the nature of the curriculum he is going to persuade you that this curriculum, the education that he's going to give you, that you're going to need when you get up there, is absolutely adequate to not only overcome every obstacle you'll face here, but to enable you to do the job that you're going to be doing when you get up there. And even though you are going to encounter opposition to this down here, and you are, that even though that is not going to prevent you from obtaining the fullness of your sonship life either here or up there. That it's absolute, everything is taken into account. And that he has very wisely 
figured in every single opposition to this. And he knows. Everything from what's in your mind saying, I don't know about this, to the policy of evil that Satan has designed to get you to stop and to walk away from this. He has every bit of that built into the curriculum. That's how complete it is so that you're able to cope with anything and everything that comes your way. And you're supposed to view the curriculum just that way, that it's absolutely complete and that there's been nothing that's been overlooked, there's nothing that's left out. And not only that, but you're not going to look for any other alternative way of trying to produce this. And by the way, there's a real important way, reason why you won't be looking for some alternative way to get this done. Does anybody know what that way, why, that, why that is? Huh? You, you, well, okay, you won't need one. You won't want one. You won't want one. That's true. But even if, well, it would be a counterfeit. But is there anything else that can actually do this? No. no. There is no other way to get it done. And so when you look at this and you see the nature of this curriculum and that it is put together so wisely by your Heavenly Father that it is perfectly done and it overlooks nothing and it will do everything that it is said that it will do. And there's no other way to get it done. There's nothing and there's no shortcut you can take. There's no alternative way of getting it done. That is supposed to make you look at this curriculum now and hold this in such high esteem that you now see it the way your Heavenly Father intends for you to see it. It's not just, another, it's not just you going to class. It's not just another education. This thing is beyond anything you've ever laid your eyes on. And what it's going to do for you, what it's going to produce in you now, is beyond... You know what? It really does. And I'll just bring it up again quickly. What I, it's, it's what has been referred to as the holy grail of what saved people are after. People are always looking at decisions they have to make and they're saying, what am I supposed to do? You know, how many times have I had a preacher friend who had a church, he's pastoring a church, and all of a sudden another church contacts him and says, we'd like for you to come and, and be our pastor. And now he's got a choice to make. So you know what he does then? He begins to wring his hands and go, am I supposed to stay or am I supposed to go? And then we have all these little cliches that we use, I'm saying this kindly to you, that are worthless. We say this, well, if God didn't want me to go, I guess he wouldn't open the door. You have to be kidding me. Really? Because you have an opportunity, you're, th you're thinking that is now God's will? Do you realize that you have the opportunity to stop at every gas station in town and buy one gallon of gas and get your car filled up? I guess if God didn't open the door, He wouldn't want you to do it. That is ridiculous. I'm, okay, I'm sorry. I was not going to be ugly about this. I don't have a better word. <laughs> That's ridiculous. That, that thing, they go over to Revelation. I'm the God that opens the door that no man opens, closes the door that... I, I, I open the door that no man closes, and I close the door that no man opens. See what they're saying? God, if you don't want me to go to this other church, then close the door. I'm just going to be straight with you. He's not going to do that. You say, how do you know that? Because I have also seen where not only did a guy have a church, but he had two other churches that were offering him a position. And no doors got closed. Now what's he supposed to do? Well, I guess if God wanted me to stay, he wouldn't have opened the door. Well, great, you still got two options out there. Which one are you going to take? Well, God closed the door on the one you don't want me to have. At the end of it, guess how many churches still want him? Both of them. Well, three, right, the one he's at. So then he goes, well, I need to pray about this and I need to get a peace. Oh, look, I'm not trying to be ugly about it. I'm not. I'm trying to educate you. All you're doing there 
It's trying to get yourself in a frame of mind where you feel okay about whatever decision it is that you make. I'm going to show you how outlandish this is. I remember going up to Indiana. There was a church in Indiana that was looking for a pastor. Some of the folks that were members of that church had moved down to Texas during a time of economic turndown up north, and they knew me down here. In fact, they were in the church that I was in. So when they moved back to Indiana and their pastor died, they put my name in the hat. And they said, we want to bring you up to Indiana. We want you to spend the day. We want you to preach Sunday morning and preach Sunday night and then meet with our board after church. Now I thought, okay. So I, I, I went up to do that. And I not only preached Sunday morning and Sunday night, but between the services, before the Sunday night service, I asked people to come and do a question answer. They could ask me any question they wanted to ask me and they could find out where I stood on anything. And so we did that. And we had about an hour question and answer deal. And I mean, it just, it went, there was no lag in it. I mean, it really went. And then I preached Sunday night. And then I, I uh, met with the board after it was over. And then I came back to Texas to see what they were going to think about that. So they had a vote. And in their bylaws, they said that every vote needed to be passed by a 95% margin. Okay. Well, they had a group of people who were involved in a singing ministry. They were gone the Sunday I was there. Uh, they were actually relatives of the pastor, the previous pastor, who had passed away. But this whole group, it wasn't just his kids, but it was other people as well, that a whole group of folks that had gone and they were on this... See, and I, didn't, I never met them. So they called me the next week. My buddy Frank called me up and he said, well, we didn't get 95%, so we're still looking. I said, okay. And he said, but I want to tell you why. I said, okay, tell me why. He said, the group that didn't meet you is the group that voted against you. I said, okay. And I could tell he wasn't happy about it. And he said, and so I have the ringleader of that group here to explain why. And he handed him the phone. And the guy got on the phone. He goes, hello? <laughs> I mean, I don't need an explanation. You didn't do it. You didn't do it. That's fine. And I said, hey, how you doing? He said, look, I just wanted to tell you that the reason we didn't vote for you, I know we didn't meet you, and we didn't get to talk with you, and we didn't get to ask you any questions, but... The reason we voted against you is because we prayed and we just felt like you weren't God's will. And I said, okay, that's fair, but can I, can I help y'all out and save you some money? If that's how that works, don't bring anybody in. Just say their name and then y'all pray that week and find out if God wants them or not. That'll save you some money. Because really, you brought me all the way to Indiana and put me up for a couple of days and then brought me all the way back home and you didn't need to meet me. You don't need to meet anybody then, do you? He went, well, I mean, I said, no, I'm just trying to be consistent with what you're telling me. You don't need to meet anybody. All you need to do is pray and see how you feel about it. Right? Who would carry on their life that way? Who would carry on their life that way? When you went on a job interview, you should never ask how much they're going to pay you. You should just pray and say, God, do I get this job or not? Because if he tells you that's the one, then that ought to be all, it ought to be over, right? I'm just trying to use this argument and show you the absurdity of it. Why even ask how much am I... What am I going to be doing? All you need to know is, does he want you to have it? Right? Let's quit being hypocrites about this process. It either works that way or it doesn't. All the rest of it is nonsense. If that's really how it works, you pray and find out about it, and you don't need to know anything else. Yes? Now that's a tough pill to swallow, isn't it? I, I was as nice as I could be about it. 
I'm trying to get you how we have invented. Here's my real point. Did you ever find that in Paul's epistles to instruct you to do that? Where did you get that? Because you didn't get it out of the doctrine that belonged to you. Where did you get that idea? You got that from other people who don't have a Bible verse for it either. And you know what? Let's just take that back to... Okay, I'm not upset. I'm not upset. I know everybody's with my wife. So I'm like, Calm down. But look, let's go back to Israel's program. In Israel's program, that's not what they were doing either. That's not what they were doing. Okay. I, I, I think you get that idea. Now, I got off on that because what I'm trying to show you is what you're being told here that's going to edify you folks is not how you feel about something. What edifies you is not how many people told you they thought this is what you should do? What is it that edifies you? There's only one thing. What is it? It's the Word. It's the Word. And if you can't find it in the Word, leave it alone. Because you're just asking for trouble. I see a guy say, going for a job interview and he's saying, Oh God, you know if this is your if this is your will, I just let, you know let him offer me the job. Then they get he gets the job and he goes, man, God gave me this job. Of course, I I don't ever argue with people about that. I don't. I'm saying this to you now because I'm trying to teach you something about your Bible. But that's fine. But when he says, you know, I know God gave me this job. I know God gave me this job. You'll never convince me God didn't give me this job. A month later, he's quit. And you go, well, you're not working over there? No, the boss was a jerk. Well, wait a minute. Didn't God know that when he gave you the job? Did that surprise God? Do you know what that was? He needed a job and he took the job. And when the job didn't work out the way he wanted, he didn't want it anymore, so he quit. Let's just be honest about it. If you're going to live your life based on your feelings, you're in big trouble. You're never going to get it as a son. Now, I'm pleading with you here. I know this is not the way we got taught. I'm pleading with you here. And you know when this is over, I'm not going to go buttonhole anybody. I have never done that in the years I've been here. I'm not going to start now. But I am going to tell you the truth now because you didn't bring me here to tell you what you wanted to hear. And that's not what we're doing. And that's, and that's not going to happen. So the only way to do that is to get rid of me. And I'm going to go kicking and screaming. So here's the deal. You're supposed to view this curriculum as being absolutely complete. That's what's going to effectually work in you. And you realize there's nothing else that can do what it's designed to do. And so what I did last time, and I just that's where we left off, so that's where I want to take you. What time we got left? I want to take you back to Romans 8, because all I did is show you, when we get back to Romans 8, I just pointed at the doctrine. You know, let me just put it up here. I just pointed at the doctrine... That's going to show you the nature of the curriculum that is supposed to produce in you an absolute trust in what your Heavenly Father tells you. Listen, I, I have no agenda here except this one. I do have this agenda. My agenda is to get you to believe the words that are written in this book and not to trust anything else. And if I say it, and that's not what this book says, you throw my words out and you go with this book. Yes? yes? It's this book that affects... How many times have I told you, I, I can't produce edification. My words won't do that. Only God's word can do that. And if you're going to make it as a son, you're going to have to get focused on his word and his word alone. And the reason I'm being so insistent about this is because if you look around, 
what is sweeping over us like a tidal wave is preaching and teaching and believing and, and, and singing that, that takes us in just the opposite direction. And if we're going to make it, this is part of the hard price you're going to pay of saying it's either God's Word or it's nothing. And, and, and there is no other option. Now, you may not yet see that, but I'm trying to lay the groundwork so that you can. And so when he shows you the nature of the curriculum, let me take you back to Romans and just show that to you. Romans 8, 31. He begins to ask you this question. What shall we then say to these things? He said, what are we going to say about this? Then he does a series of questions. If God be for us, who can be against us? We did this last time. Just answer that. If God be for you, who can be against you? Nobody. It ought to be enough, right? Sure. Look at this next one. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him all of, uh, uh, also freely give us all things? Well, he would, wouldn't he? Everything you're going to need. All things doesn't mean everything that pops into my brain that I can think of. It means everything you're going to need in this sonship education and edification. Verse 33, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It's Christ that died, yea, rather that's risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he gives you that whole list. We've kind of looked at this before. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are... Look what he says. We're killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. It doesn't matter what comes against you. This curriculum has the ability to make you more than a conqueror. You know what that means? This thing wasn't... Those things that come against you weren't intended to make you a conqueror. What were they intended for? To conquer you. To make you quit. This curriculum has the power to take the very thing that is supposed to conquer you and make you quit. It has the power to take that and make you more than a conqueror. It produces the very opposite of what it was that, that attack was supposed to produce. Now that's a powerful curriculum. But that only happens in a son who's not only educated, but edified. But the good part about edification is, those three things about edification, God is the one doing all three of them. Your part is to believe what He tells you. Now isn't that, isn't that the way it ought to work? Thank God for that. This, this, all, when we get, now all I'm doing is showing it to you. We're not really talking about it yet. We're almost back over there, so when we get over there, we will be talking about this. All I'm doing is showing it to you, but what I'm trying to show you is that when you get back over here, you're going to have all these things you're going to be, you're going to be shown. Here's the things that's going to be against you. Here's the things to make you think this curriculum's insufficient. Here's the thing to make you think your father overlooked something. Here's the thing to make you think this isn't really going to work for me. You know, it might work for Wanda, but, you know, it's not working for me. Well, you know as well as I do, if it works for Wanda, it works for anybody, right? <laughs> Welcome back, Wanda. Okay. Now, look, here's my point. You're going to be confronted with all of those issues. And what you, God is going to get you to the place is where you're going to make the, the statement that Paul makes in the next verse. For I am persuaded, in spite of all of that, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, I'm supposed to have a stop there. So these verses are so, when we get over there, they're going to make a very powerful impact on you to show you that your father not only has given you everything that you need in this education, but he is committed to your success as a son. And that's exactly what he intends to do. Now, I think I've done everything with that that I need to do, and I think you get that. The second part is, 
that God's going to do. He's going to, he has made this curriculum this way and he's going to show it to you in that light. That's the nature of the curriculum. The next thing is the trustworthiness of the one who wrote it. And that is God's word and he's the one that wrote it. How trustworthy is he? We could dismiss that very easily and go, he's completely trustworthy. But you know what? Me saying that to you and you just saying he's completely trustworthy is not the effectual working of that doctrine to produce that assurance in you. You need that doctrine to be effectually working in you, to produce that kind of assurance. And what you're going to have to have in conjunction with that is you're going to have to have a spirit of faith. Now, I want to show you this. I'm going to take you back, since we're looking at the exhortation in Israel's program, I'm going to take you back, in, in, still in their program, to Psalm 116. There's a particular verse that I'm after. We're going to start at verse 1 to get a context. I love the Lord because He hath heard my voice and my supplications, because He hath inclined His ear unto me. Therefore will I call upon Him as long as I live. The sorrows of death come past me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord, and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low, and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. This is the verse I'm after, verse 10. I believed, therefore I have spoken. I want you to notice that first part, because what we're talking about, don't lose track, is the edification. What is your part in the edification? Believe. To believe. And what David is doing here when he says this is, and we're going to keep reading the passage, but David is... He is exhibiting what I wrote right here, a spirit of faith. Now, I'm not making that up. You say, oh, I kind of see how that works. He said, I believed. He had a spirit of faith. Paul, is, in, in your epistles and mine, is going to quote so, that verse out of Psalm 116, and Paul's going to tell you David had a spirit of faith. I didn't pull that phrase out of thin air. Your apostle is going to use that phrase. That's why I put it up there. I believed, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. That sounds like a, 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 a woman wrote that, doesn't it? Okay, sorry. Okay. What? I just couldn't resist. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I'll pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all His people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. All right, now, that's Psalm 116. Like I said, the verse is really after there in verse 10. And what was generated in David when he wrote that, I believe, therefore have I spoken, was that spirit of faith. What was he believing? You tell me. What was he believing? He's believing what God had said, was he not? Was he making up what he wanted and said, I just believe that? No. no. Listen to me. Faith, oh, there's ten things we need to do with this. And I just, I called this down. But look, faith is all about believing what God tells you. Today, there's this big move on that you just believe whatever it is you want to believe. And if you have faith, God will do it. You put the cart in front of the horse. Let me let, turn, turn with me. I want to show you Hebrews 11. This is not in your notes. But I'm just thinking about this while we're at it. Everybody calls this the great faith chapter. But you know this is in the book of Hebrews. So this is for the believing remnant that's out there in the day of wrath. And they're going to be called to believe some things too. They also are going to have to believe some things. Just like you're going to have to believe some things. They're going to be called to believe some different things. Because you're going to be saved from that day of wrath. But I want you to look in verse 11, uh, chapter 11 in verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now look at this. Verse 3. 
Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. How did you understand how the world came into being? How did you ever understand that? How do you know how this world came in? The Word told you that, didn't it? So if you believe that, you're not believing how the world came in because it's your idea and you just believe it. You're believing what God told you. I want you to just keep going through here. Uh, let's see. Um, verse 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Wait a minute. Did Noah say, I just think I need to build an ark and I'm just going to have faith and I'm just going to do that? Or did he do that because he was told something by God? See, he was told something and that's what his faith was in. By, verse 8, by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place. Did Abraham say, I think I'm just going to leave my homeland and I'm just going to trust God. I'm going to believe. I'm going to have faith and God's going to bless it and he's going to multiply it. and He's going. No, who told him to do that? And he believed what God told him. That's the faith he had. When you look at that, verse 9, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country. Who told him to do that? God told him to. He was, he was put his faith in what God told him. Verse 11, through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered child when she was past age because she really wanted it real bad and she just claimed it by faith because she believed him who promised. That's what her faith was in. We have this backwards. Nowadays what we want to do is we want to say, you just see what you want to believe and you believe it real hard and God will just honor that. I don't find that as a Bible doctrine. And someone says, well, I don't care what you say. I did that and look what God did. It may, I'm not saying it didn't work that way this time or that. I'm just saying God didn't do it. Faith is in His Word. That's the point I'm trying to make here. And you could keep going. I think you've seen it. But I mean, this whole thing is through. By, by faith, this one did this. And by faith, this one did that. They didn't dream up any of that. They were told and they believed what they were told. What did David say? I believed, therefore I have spoken. He said, what I'm talking about is what God's talking about. That's what, and when you're, when you're going to be edified... And you're talking about the second thing God's going to do is He's going to demonstrate how trustworthy He is. The one that wrote that curriculum can absolutely be trusted that this thing is right. That's the point that He's trying to make. Okay, we're almost out of time, so I need to get back to this. Let's see. Um, I want to give you this verse, 2 Corinthians 4, because Paul's going to quote this verse over in 2 Corinthians. Now, I need to set up 2 Corinthians very briefly. You know that 2 Corinthians is one of Paul's epistles, so that's us. You also know that he writes 1 Corinthians because they've walked away from their sonship life. They've decided they don't want the suffering that goes with that. They walked away from it. But when they got them, he wrote 1 Corinthians, and they got themselves back on track... But there, that did not do away with their sufferings and tribulations. So he writes 2 Corinthians to them to say, here's how you're going to deal with those things that come about in your life. And so as he begins to do this, now with that kind of in your mind, as he's describing the, the sufferings of Christ and what they're going to need, I want you to see what he says. Look in 4.7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Now, that, I'll talk about that treasure in just a moment, but does anybody understand what the earthen vessel is? That's us. These bodies are pretty frail, aren't they? And boy, when they fall heir to things, oh boy. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. In other words, the things that are going to come your way, you're not going to have the power to overcome those. But there is an excellency of power that is of God. And you know what? He's not, he's not talking about turning earthen vessels into, into iron vessels. Those vessels are still... By the way, 
Did your body get redeemed when you trusted Jesus to be your Savior? No, it did not. It's the same old body. I mean, I'm saved. I'm still as bald-headed now as I was. Well, I got saved before I was bald-headed, and I still went bald. What does that mean? Let me just get... Let me, let, let, okay, I t this is a perfect place to stop. Because what I'm going to show you in the verses following here is a list of what Paul is going to describe as the excellency of the power. And I'm going to tell you now that most pastors today will scoff and laugh at this list. They do not see this as the power of God, let alone the excellency of the power. Instead, they would look at this list and say, anybody that was under the things listed here are nothing but losers and, and, and folks that, you know, aren't doing the right thing. Paul is going to say, I'm going to show you a list where the excellency of the power is going to be manifested. And it is a power that is greater than you might imagine. But we need to read through it to be able to understand it. So we'll take our break and then we'll come back and we'll take a look at it. Okay, you're dismissed.